Samson Tsigai, who I have the pleasure to introduce now. He arrived this weekend with the smile of the Ethiopian sun and surrounded by the smell of coffee. And coming from the cradle of coffee, this is not a surprise. Samson was born in 1966 in Addis Abeba. He holds diplomas in engineering, project management, business management, but he's mainly today an engineer in solar technology. And he's the country director of the Solar Energy Foundation. And as such, he received our award, the Nuclear Free Future Award, in the category of solution. And we honor people who see a problem, who don't agree with the situation and act. And that's what he does. And he doesn't get intimidated by the circumstances if they are against him. He received in 2009, he received another award, the Ashton Award. We met at a conference of environmental laureates in Freiburg and that's how we learned about his work. He is a bringer of light, I would say. And in his country, he established two solar training centers. He electrified four villages, 157 schools. And it means the electricity in those schools is cheaper. It's reliable because it can be managed by the people. And it also means you can teach in the evening. And I leave it up to Samson now because he brought uh, images for us to see. And then the idea is that after his talk, we all are here together and we can bombard him with questions. And I'm very pleased that Professor Schrimpf brought an Ethiopian friend with him. So I'm really, I, I'm sure this will uh, be uh, add some fire to it. So, Samson, please. Thank you and good evening. Uh, I would like to thank NFFA to invite me for such an um, important event uh, to tell uh, our experience, uh, what we did in Ethiopia in the past uh, 10 years and 12 years. Uh, I am Samson Zagai. Uh, uh, yeah, most, most history is explained by uh, Klaus. Uh, I want to ask you one question. I'm from Ethiopia. How many of you know that Ethiopia has 13 months? Yes. yes. We have 13 months in Ethiopia. Ah. <laughs> How many? Yeah. Only one. Yes, we have 13 months. Ah, the Ethiopian. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> yeah. We have 13 months in Ethiopia, uh, and we say it's 13 months of sunshine country. Uh, in 2002, I came here, uh, no, I went to Paris normally. I was um, a civil engineer uh, and working for a construction company before. And it was 2002, my boss bring me to Paris. And uh, after we visit the construction fair there, he gave me five days to visit Paris. But <coughs> I was not happy there, I was disappointed, like, I don't know because I tried to talk to people, I asked them questions, no one answers for me. I was disappointed then, what's wrong? Because I am from Africa or what? And I know some friends from Germany, I know them in Ethiopia and I send them an email, email and uh, I asked them what's wrong here? My boss gave me a five day Paris tour, but no one wants to talk to me. How can I visit uh, the city with this situation? And she, my friend asked me, do you speak French? I say no. 
That's the only problem. <laughs> if you're not happy, come to Germany. It's possible, yes. If I'm not happy there, yes, I want to come to Germany. That was the beginning for me. When I come to Germany, it was in Freiburg. Uh, my friends were in Freiburg, and the solar, uh, inter-solar affair was in, in Freiburg. And the uh, next day, they asked me if I want to go to this fair. I never heard about solar technologies before. And uh, the three days, it was three days, and three days walking inside, talking to people and asking people, and it was a surprise for me. Because in Ethiopia, we buy umbrella for the sun. Uh, and many of our people in uh, rural area live in darkness. <coughs> uh, this is how uh, our people, I mean, this is their house. They have nothing here. They are elect uh, energy source or electric sources, firewood or kerosene. It's difficult to access firewood. It's difficult also to access kerosene even. So mostly after sunset, life is dead in most of our rural areas. Okay. So we are growing fast. We are over 100 million now. 85% uh, <clears throat> of this population live in rural areas. Electric access, electric access for these people is less than 17%. Over 40 million people still need solutions. What we need? The indoor pollution, what we talk it in the house, they use as uh, light firewood. It smokes a lot. It's not healthy, it's depressed in the house. And for students, for the kids, I, I sometimes spend the night there to install the solar. I, I, I cry a lot because of the smoke. I don't know how they live with this, uh, with such very bad situation for their whole life. Health is another issue because of this bad smoke in the house, bad situation in the house. Health is also a very serious issue. Migration, I will explain a little bit more uh, in the next slides. Because of these problems in the rural areas, migration is a very serious problem for our youngsters in the areas. Deforestation is an issue. Uh, I think it's a little bit improving now. It was about 40% the coverage uh, some 60 years ago, but four or five years ago it was 3% only. You can count the trees in rural areas. I'm really jealous when, I'm, I, when I come to Germany, when I walk out and with trees and the jungle and all. <coughs> really jealous for that. Cost of fuel, kerosene. Kerosene gas per liter, they buy, uh, we buy before like six years, about, uh, I don't know how can you say, convert it, about tuber in Ethiopia. You just can count the number. And now is 14 bur. A, a, a normal family with two kids or like this, they consume up to four liter per year, I mean per month. It's too much. They have to walk long, long distance to access even this kerosene. At least, even it's bad. Education is an issue. Most of the rural kids they have to walk long distances to school and back. When they're back home, it's totally dark. They cannot do their homework. No competition with others. So they, uh, they withdraw in a short time, like when, I, when they are grade four or five, like this, no school after then. The other problem is water. For this also, they have to walk long, long distances. Uh, in a village, uh, we have a solar village in uh, one of the region. Um, the water source is in the valley, down the valley. They have to walk at 4 a.m. to reach there and to fetch the water. When they back, if you understand it, I don't know, 300 meter elevation difference from the down up to there. Myself, even with my clothes, I cannot walk up. 
uh, those poor kids, maybe uh, if you saw my first picture on the uh, screen, 25 liter plastic jerry can they hold and they climb up all this. They cannot reach on time to school. They cannot go to school. When they go to school late, the teacher will say go back. It's another challenge for them. So all these are the issues uh, for our uh, uh, off-grid communities. Uh, we need solution for that. At Solar Energy Foundation, I'm working for uh, this foundation since 2005. Uh, after I saw in 2002 <coughs> the fair in Freiburg, uh, I was asking myself, here in Germany they told me some year is like uh, three, four months, it's too dark, no sun, and it's not possible really to have us that. But the German was the first, the, the, the first, um, I mean the biggest, who installed solar. And every house I saw this glass on the roof. Oh, we say 13 months of sunshine country, but we still live in darkness. I start searching things and studying myself and uh, asking people about the technology. I back home, I try to find out who is working on this. Found few suppliers, uh, but they are working only with telecom, not with households like this. It was very expensive at the time. <laughs> I, I remember once um, I, I came to Germany again uh, after two years, I think, and I heard that a 10 watt panel can light six or four lamps like this. And I came here and I asked one of my German friends, can I get a 10 watt panel? He, uh, he said, for what? Do you want to do some toys or something like this? No, to change life. The, the understanding is different, yes, it's clear. <laughs> then <clears throat> with the foundation, uh, as I mentioned, I was working uh, on myself. Uh, I start with a small NGO, try to find sources to electrify people, but it was really challenging. I use my spare time, Sunday, Saturday, free installation for the people, com connect people, and I try to work by myself. But then 2005, Stiftung Solar Energy, uh, established by the founder Harald Schutzeichel. He was the CEO of a big solar company here in Germany, uh, Axel Moss, I think. And he was looking for somebody in Ethiopia. I joined this company, and since then, we did a great job for the country, I can say. For households, <coughs> as I mentioned, a 10 watt panel can change life. With 10 watt panel, we provide them four lights. They can plug their radios. There was no mobile phone then. At the time, it was not a headache. But now, so yes, there is a mobile uh, network they need it for mobile charging also. Over 40,000 households electrified with a special approach. As an NGO, we never give free. And we want the owners, I mean the users, to feel ownership on the equipment. With this approach, we are successful, I can say. It was a big fight with the government the first days because the government says no, people cannot, uh, the rural people can't afford. Business company says if you give it for free, we will die. Uh, users also, th what they know is their experience with NGOs is getting for free. All NGOs giving them for free, but we are uh, crazy people asking them money. <laughs> I, I was demonstrating the technology for the people one day, and I explained them this is solar panel, it works from solar, blah, blah, always from solar. And then we brought you this, so you can save this much money, you can pay this much money. An old lady stretch her hand and you say this is from solar, yes. Is this from the sun, yes. All from the sun, yes. So what the hell, the hell are you asking money for that? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, the other problem that I mentioned is the water supply. Uh, many places they really use very, very bad uh, accumulated water. It's not even a spring, mostly. And for me, even I cannot touch it, uh, my feeling, but they drink this kind of water. So 
we try to bring them a solar pumping uh, the, for the village, a solar village. We install them three spots and the whole village now supplied with the water. We reach uh, around 10 villages with uh, solar water pumping. And also uh, we supply a cooling system for clinics and uh, many uh, health centers, they don't have any electricity, especially when they have a delivery, they use their mobile phone and their mouse and light for the delivery. It's really sad to see that. But we tried at least, and we tried to address around 55, and it's changed a lot. It's not uh, small for myself. We did something. The other one is, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, we don't give it for free. Our project was with a revolving fund project. We agreed with the government, but after some years they refused to do that. As NGO, they told us you have to give it for free. No, it's not bread. This is technology, and we need sustainability for this. It was a big fight, but uh, we cannot fight with the government. They stopped us. And then we changed our approach to, I mean, to the students' uh, program, uh, Lighting Student Homes program. At least if we gave it for students for free, we can say they, have, you know, they don't have money to pay. At least it gives sense. So with this light, Lighting Student Home, uh, we uh, delivered 2,000 solar lanterns. This will continue until uh, uh, the next uh, three years, uh, four years. We want to reach 10,000 of this. With this lantern, our main uh, objective is students, as I mentioned, they cannot be competitive with other students, those who have electricity. When they back home, after a two hour walk back, no light at home. They can do their homework. They can be competitive. This is an issue of migration, especially women. In the morning, they have to fetch water. They come to school late. They can't continue. In the evening, they can't go home early. They can't continue their schools. So families push them to go to the Arab countries and something, and they really suffer there. Yeah, uh, the challenge uh, to do, I mean, to continue these things, so what, why we need to do more. In the schools, I mean, in the village, the kids are very loaded. I don't know how can I say. For me, uh, oh, sorry. <coughs> what do you see here? They have to walk 10 kilometers, seven kilometers, eight kilometers, two kilometers, which I can't really uh, do it every day. But they have to walk that much and carry such small wood in their head and for their fire. The small kids, this here, I was driving to our solar village just a week ago, and I saw them uh, carrying these two heavy uh, things, and I stopped my car and uh, I asked them, where are you going? They are looking for meals. They have to walk five kilometers with this. Walk to the mill and then back with this uh, load again. Oh, I was really sad for that. They are, uh, I don't know. I can't do it with my. Here, the kids, they have to fetch water like that. They have to walk down. Uh, one day, I, I thought I can, I'm a bit stronger than them, uh, the small kid with this small five liter jerkin was climbing up and I thought it's difficult for him and I asked him to help. But I was carrying him, but I couldn't walk five meters. And he said, uh, so can I take it back? <laughs> I said, okay, <laughs> it's painful for me. Yeah, they have a lot of work at home. So uh, this brings them to uh, the other decision like for migration and other issues. <laughs> I would like to, to talk a little bit about our migrations. Uh, in the schools today, maybe uh, young girls, to get a passport, they have to be 18. But they get uh, a forged ID, which tells they are 18, but they are 13 or 14. And they get this, their passport and they went to uh, Arab countries illegally. This is a picture I took from the ILO, uh, how they walk to Yemen. 
it's all these distances, and many of them died on the street and on the sea. Uh, we saw many stories there. Even when they go there, most of them are housemaid. Housemaid mean in Arab countries is really a slavery, even more than slavery. They're not working for one family. When they have free time, they send them to their relatives. All time they have to walk. Many suicides, many of them kill themselves, uh, fall down from the 10th floor, 5th, 5th floor like this. And many of them found, hang them in the houses because they have no solution. They cannot go to other places. Only a few of them uh, in Lebanon, uh, uh, men especially, they are driver. Uh, in Kuwait, the same uh, men can do some driving or something like this. But most of them, they are working like a housemate. The other problem there is they are forced to do a lot, long hours, but no uh, uh, extra time fee for that. They have to work for that uh, agreed fee. Their passport is taken when they arrive. They cannot take it. They cannot move anywhere. They have to stay at that house until they leave. <coughs> Maltreatment is they are beaten by uh, the wives, a husband, or something like this. Uh, and uh, I have some pictures you will see. And the regu irregular salary payments. They don't get a real salary when they leave or when the month comes. They told them you're using the electricity bill, uh, the water, and something like this, and they cut all the bills and maybe they don't get anything. These are the biggest issues uh, when they are there. These are the consequences, what we saw. Uh, many of them died before they arrived. Some of them are in prison because they try to escape and they don't have passport. They, are, they put them in prison. And many of them are in the hospital. Uh, we have a lot of uh, Facebook information. Do you know this lady? She was in Kuwait or she was in Saudi or something. No one knows who, who she is because there is no passport. And they are beaten like this, and they really suffer there. Most of them are dying. Maybe you, you saw these stories on the uh, news many times. It's really sad. Yeah, to stop this, I, uh, we try. <coughs> bringing light to the houses. In rural area, the students, the youngsters, the girls and boys, they are brilliant. Their mind is really open because they're not uh, confiscated with uh, these new technologies like Facebook, blah, blah, blah. They are only concentrating on the studies if they get a chance. So if we bring them light, if they get a chance in the evening, they can change their life. We can bring new generation or better generation for that. This is a small lantern. What do you do with this if you have at home? What will you do with this? Will you buy it if you see it in the market? You will buy it, I know. <laughs> yeah, this is a light we give for students. They can study and their families can benefit out of this. This is the last, I mean, the recent project we have, but with the previous one, they got four lights, three lights, two lights, according to their uh, uh, room size. But now, uh, as we have to give it for free, uh, we come up with this uh, solution. We give them this lantern, they take it home. Uh, the, owner sh the owner is a uh, school for the lamp. They have to show the lamps uh, every two months that uh, still they're using it, they didn't sell it. So we are very uh, successful with this project, and uh, we're trying to reach uh, 10,000 in the coming three years. We need your help. <laughs> yeah, what you see here is, what do you see here? This is a house with solar light and a biogas uh, cooker, and here is with no light. It's a big difference here. I can have the appetite if I'm living in this house to read or see it with the family and do more work there. But down, you can see it. It's not healthy, it's really depressed, and I don't want to do anything. With and uh, in the house, the cows, everything, and one house living. So what do we expect from here? A bright face when they have light, 
and I can tell it. I, I gave money for people, but I, I didn't see such happiness. Giving light for the people is really, really, really special. When I own the light, I, I, I feel cry immediately. My tears are on my eyes. These are our technicians uh, who are graduated, and I want more kids to come to this level. This is the school students who got the lanterns. These are also the students who get the lanterns. Sorry. The other thing is, I just want to uh, mention something here, what Axel says. Currently, we have a big problem in the market, in the solar market in Ethiopia. There are very low, uh, low quality, substandard uh, products. It's Chinese, we say Chinese, but this is also Chinese. But certified Chinese <coughs> ones and uh, uncertified Chinese ones. The price difference, it's just a lantern, one lantern. The cheapest one, uh, we sell this around 40 euro, but it can serve them five years. But the other one, the same, looks like same, copied ones, they can sell it for like five euro. How can we uh, convince our customers, the same, looks same, but they don't understand the technical things inside. Five and 40 is big difference. We have big, big uh, challenge now in the market, so we have to work on the awareness. We are training the people. We explain them in a good way, and we try to be together, I mean, close to them uh, by giving them after sale service uh, so they can trust us, and we try to uh, create trust by giving them uh, the know-how. <coughs> so we need help, yes, to expand our work. We need such kids, happy kids. This side, you see him, it's really poor, yes? But his heart is really rich for my soul. He wants to go to school with this situation. We, want, we have to help these kids. Thank you so much.